Welcome everyone to staff development this afternoon on this early release day. Thank you for being here. I'm going to speak just a couple of things because before we go into food allergy. Flu prevention. You received some information I think recently around flu prevention. We're having uh, a concern around flu prevention because it appears that the incidences of flu are starting early this year in October. What we normally would see in a spike around February, we're seeing it in October. So what does that mean? We, we have to stay tuned and watch it closely, but it means you need to re-emphasize your flu prevention on campuses. Where are the schools that are a pilot with Perel? This one here. There should be a couple of more. There's one over there. Any more? I think there's about six. What it means is a special um, pilot by the company Perel has provided hand sanitizers in the building. Carol, you've got one. And then they've also put monitors for health-related information in the building so that students can see it. These flat screen monitors are up. Um, so it's a pilot that we're looking at as far as the company providing that information and that those resources in the schools. Um, <clears throat> so I encourage you to, again, reemphasize flu prevention, that be in hand uh, hygiene, cough etiquette, and of course flu vaccines. You know as well as I know that children can get flu vaccines and encouraging families to do so. It is a recommendation, it is not a requirement. But we're looking at probably a pretty, pretty intense flu season coming up. It's the H3N1 virus that we're looking at. And it is in the flu vaccine. It's been included in the flu vaccine. So strongly encourage your families and staff, if they haven't gotten their flu vaccine, they can go locally to the drugstore or to their primary care providers or to, if they're eligible, to go to the county certainly to take advantage of that. I want to remind you, I sent an email out, I think it's been about two weeks, that we are, have a posting for nurse supervisor positions. We have two positions, actually, that are available. One is Division One, the other is Division Five. In Division Five, that was Emily Lewis, and she has done a lateral move over to the medically complex student. Um, supervisor position that used to be held by Robin Shannon and so that opens up division five and then division one by Karen Pullen is leaving where's Karen there she is and she's going to work at Children's Medical Center and so um, we are losing Karen I still think she's gonna come back but <laughs> once she gets into the rigor of the hospital again but uh, and the door will be open for her if she wants to come back but at this time we then that opens up a second position so I encourage you um, to go online and look at the posting and if you um, meet those requirements certainly to um, to um, submit your application so Oh, now we're down to food allergy. I'm going to run down basically a timeline with you because I've had some questions. Um, food allergy, we fir first knew that something was coming in Texas. I think it's been on the, um, in Austin for some time around food allergy, but it looked like we might have a new law. We were told last January. At that time, um, I went ahead and changed our H2 our health history because the number one thing in a food allergy um, campaign to identify children is to identify children and our tool that we use is the H2 when we're trying to identify any type of health problem with the child so that was changed it was used last January and then uh, we're going to re we repeated that this fall in enrollment packets in January, I knew that we had an H2. I also knew that we had an anaphylaxis emergency algorithm that were, was already in place. I knew you knew how to write an IHP, and you knew how to interview families 
to get more information to, about their allergies or any health problem to write that IHP and then to train staff around that. So in May, May 31st, the actual law went at, would did pass. And part of that team, that task force that worked on that, Dr. Bird, who is with us today, is one of the leading specialists on food allergy that was part of that task force. And we're very fortunate to have him in Dallas. And we've tapped his resources to be here today. But he, along with school nurses, both in TSNO and other school nurses around the table, built this law that came into effect May 31st. And that was when I actually got to see what the components were in that law, because that's what we were going to be held responsible for. So then the next step was to be sure and get it approved by the district that we can um, accept this law. And so the Texas Association of School Boards wrote the legal policy around the food allergy comprehensive plan that came into effect the end of June. At the same time, I wrote a local policy around food allergy. This is FFAF, both legal and local. And then that was approved by the board the end of June. In the meantime, Emily Lewis came down to Central and began a review of literature. She went out to the school districts and to other places across the nation and pulled in what looked like best practices around food allergy in schools and how that was managed. And then she looked within Texas. What is it in, is happening in Texas? And this is, of course, going to be before the law because none of this had been put into place. So, but she began to pull those resources in Texas around food allergy and then came up with the basic skeleton and structure of our first draft. She polished it up as best she could, given the information at the time. And then she submitted that, the initial drafts to me the um, end of August. Um, <clears throat> well, I had already sent a message to you to go ahead and you put your H2s out in the enrollment packets. And I met with CRCs and registrars in June, right before school started to talk about um, this law and how it affects them as far as getting stuff in emergency and enrollment packets. And then in addition to that, I wrote something for the code of student code of conduct, student handbook, put a piece in there around food allergy. And if you haven't read that book that students get every year and sign off on it that they've read it, do so. So you'll know exactly what type of health information is in that book that parents get every single year and that we, we either change or add to or subtract, whatever is the case. But so now it was going out to families. So we brought the plan in. We continued to develop it. And in October, I presented it to our school health committee. Our school health committee is a group of physicians in the community, including Dr. Bird, to show them our final draft. But it was still a draft at that point, because I was still gathering information from a lot of different resources to continue to massage the plan and get it to the very best that it could be. And then in November, with all the final information in, then the plan was given to you. And we sent that out by, um, through an email with attachments, so you have the different components of that plan. But it's not finished. Um, Today, of course, is December, and we have a presentation by Dr. Bird, and we also have a presentation by Emily Lewis, who wrote the first draft of this plan, and she will go over the final document with you. But again, it's not over. In April, and if, when you read the actual policy, FFAF, you will see that in April of every year, the, pol the plan, the food allergy plan, is to be reviewed. So it will be done at the central level as far as the generic district-wide plan, but then you on campuses will review your individual student plans to be sure indeed that they are meeting the needs of that student and if anything needs to be changed to that. So um, again, going back to today, then Dr. Bird will present food allergy and help you understand the difference between food allergy 
as say food intolerance and other important pieces of the food allergy in general. Monday you will be uh, you will receive the snapshots and again explanation of how you get that all in the EHR all behind the scenes in the last few months Anna has been working to tweak the EHR so that it would accept all the information that is needed uh, for you as you begin to document your um, plan with the students. I just want to remind you that in the final document there were two health histories. There's the regular H2 that we're all familiar with that you send out at the beginning of the year or when a student enrolls. And there's a second one, a health history that's more comprehensive. That health history is not to be sent out to the parent to fill out. That health history is to be guided by you as you do a conference and gain more information regarding a student. That's why it was never put in Spanish. It was not meant to be a mail out and you send in more information. So through a phone call, through a visit, then you visit with the family to gain more information. And it was built for you as a tool to gain more information around specifically food allergy um, and the child so that when you write your plan, you can have that information available to, to uh, write the plan for the student. Okay, at this time I'm gonna introduce Dr. Bird. Thank you very much, Dr. Bird, for being here, and we're anxious to listen to your expertise around food allergy. Already, y'all don't even know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Maybe disappointed. Um, well, thank y'all for having me come. Uh, it's really great to be here, and uh, we're going to talk more about the details of the guidelines and so forth for the ISD. Uh, so Dan sent it to me, I wrote it over it. I'm one of those people that when you send a document and I don't find a mistake, I don't feel like I've done my job. But I couldn't find a mistake on it. I thought it was a great document. I think it's a great plan you guys have for the ISC. You can tell there's been a lot of hard work put in here. Um, so my job is really just to talk to you all about food allergies. Uh, I've never been to a talk that I thought people were disappointed if they got let out early. So this is not going to take the full, full hour, let them go as soon as I'm done. But after my slides are finished, uh, there will be plenty of time for questions. So if you want to hold those to the very end and take some notes while we're talking, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions you may have uh, related to the presentation. Does this you want to be better now? Yeah, I'm gonna do another one. This one's better. You drink twice as well. Okay, we'll do this. <laughs> um, so, the objectives for the talk today, we're gonna to talk about really what is a food allergy. Um, we'll just briefly cover SB27 and what that entailed. And then I'm going to talk to you all about what we talk to our parents about regarding what we feel the school is responsible for, but also what we feel the parents are responsible for when they come to our clinic. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'd like to start off with a scenario that we commonly see. Now this is obviously a kid that isn't in school, but this gives you an idea of how the children typically present to me, and then of course they end up in your care as they get a little bit older. But this is a 12-month-old boy uh, who the parents tell me he developed some vomiting, some runny nose, uh, he had some hives all over, um, really on his face, on his trunk, on his arms, and they said that it occurred almost immediately after he had his first piece of birthday cake. He hadn't had cake before, this was the first time, he got great concern, so they called their pediatrician, they gave him some Benadryl, uh, the pediatrician said take him to the emergency room, and they did, but by the time they got there, really the, the rash had started to resolve, he was feeling better, the rain was improving, um, and there weren't any further problems. Now being the modern parents they are, they, they had a cell phone on them and took a picture for us, which commonly happens, they bring up with them. And you can see with this little guy here, we have some redness on his cheeks, you can, see the, you, can, you can see the corner's not working, but we see some redness on his cheeks. We see a little bit of runny nose here. You might can tell a little bit of the hint that his lips are a little bit swollen and full. And this rash he has is all over. And those are signs we see of a typical immediate type of a food induced reaction or food allergy. Now what gets confusing is that the term food allergy is used to describe really a lot of different things related to food. Uh, food allergy itself falls under the umbrella term of an adverse food reaction, okay? So adverse food reactions can include either food intolerances or food allergies. A food intolerance 
refers to it in reaction to a food when the immune system is not involved. Okay, so food intolerance, think of lactose intolerance, think of food poisoning. The immune system is not involved when the body produces a response to those foods. It's a characteristic of the food itself, or perhaps of a missing enzyme in the patient that leads to lactose intolerance. Now, food allergy, on the other hand, encompasses all those other diseases that involve the immune system. So these can be immediate types of reactions that we're going to talk much more about. The guidelines themselves refer to life-threatening food allergies. So that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. Other things that are also considered food allergies are things like celiac disease. So gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, gluten sensitivity, gluten intolerance. We could talk about that for six hours today if we wanted to because I know you guys hear a lot about that. We're not going to spend a lot of time on those types of things. What I want you guys to be able to understand and recognize is who has a life-threatening food allergy? Who are the kids that are at risk of having immediate reactivity that need immediate attention? The kids with celiac disease, with the gluten intolerances, those types of things, they are not at risk for a life-threatening allergy, okay? You need to be aware of who we, do we call 911 when they accidentally come in contact with the food. That's what we're gonna talk about. Other diseases that are also considered food allergies, but again, not encompassed by SB27, are diseases like eosinophilic esophagitis, or eosinophilic gastroenteritis, atopic dermatitis can be related to food allergy, really random rare diseases like food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. There's a whole list of these different types of diseases that you aren't exactly responsible for in recognizing food allergy. You're responsible under this bill at knowing what is a life-threatening food allergy. So we'll talk a little bit more about exactly what is a life-threatening food allergy. If we go back to our kid here, he has all the signs and symptoms of what that life-threatening food allergy might initially start as, may present as. I can't predict based on testing or any other uh, modality whether a kid is going to progress to full-blown anaphylaxis or just some of these initial symptoms. So for kids who are at risk for life-threatening food allergy, we want to be aware of what are all the symptoms that can present. Number one, food-induced allergic reactions that are life-threatening are immediate and onset. It will occur 99% of the time within two hours of ingestion. If it's more than two hours later, think of something else going on. Did the kid get stung by a bee on the playground? Maybe so. Maybe that's what caused the allergic reaction. Um, is the kid throwing up? Maybe he just has a stomach virus, which is going around quite a bit right now. So, again, it's going to be immediate. It's going to be after the food is ingested. You can see things like sneezing, congestion, a runny nose. This is not your kid who comes to school every day rubbing his nose and sneezing. Allergic rhinitis is not caused by food allergy. This is immediate onset. It's very dramatic in presentation. We're not talking about the kids who are always rubbing up their noses. That's not a food allergy, okay? When the kid has had, for instance, peanut, what I often see is that in addition to seeing many other symptoms, I may see really just copious, thick mucus coming from their nose. So it's a very dramatic difference after eating the food. It is often accompanied by other symptoms, and those other symptoms might be a hoarse voice or a change in the character of their voice, difficulty breathing, they may be coughing, they may be wheezing, especially the kids who have food allergies and asthma. Their asthma may trigger. Immediately they'll start having problems breathing. We'll see on their skin that they may appear flush, so really that intense redness. They may have hives all over or urticaria. And they may also have angioedema, angioedema referring to swelling, so it can be swelling of the lips or it could be swelling of the eyes, around their eyes, sometimes you'll see swelling. You can see it really anywhere. But it's often more dramatic when it's presented on the face. Then the GI system can be involved. So with these kids, we'll see either nausea, we'll see some really severe vomiting, or maybe they'll just vomit once, but we can't commonly see vomiting. We'll see abdominal cramping, and then often kids will develop diarrhea as a presentation along with other symptoms. So the key note here is, Almost always, these symptoms occur in combination. I, I will sometimes, we do food challenges all the time for my studies, for different reasons in clinic, kids react every day. I rarely see a kid have just one symptom by itself. If I see one symptom, it might just be the urticaria or the hives. Food-induced urticaria, food-induced hives are going to come on almost immediately, and they're going to resolve almost always within six hours. So your kid that's coming to school every day that has hives, they probably have a virus that's triggering those hives, not a food allergy. So these are immediate and onset and usually resolve within six hours of ingesting the, the problematic food. Now, how common is food allergy? We know that it's beginning to increase in prevalence. We've seen over the past 10, 15 years, about an 18% increase in kids under the age of 18. The next question I get every time I talk is, why is it happening? And we don't know the answer. 
We don't know why we're seeing more of them, but we do know that they're beginning to go up. And we've looked in particular at certain foods like peanut. We've seen almost a doubling in the rate in certain areas in the country. And so we think that it is very real. But we certainly are seeing real life-threatening food allergies increasing in prevalence. The most recent numbers suggested that about 1 in 13 kids in the U.S. has a food allergy. So if I think of a typical classroom, what that means is about two kids in every classroom may have a food allergy. That may be a little overestimate, but it may not be. We may actually be seeing that, and, and you would know better than me what you're seeing in the schools as far as how many kids are presenting with food allergies. It's also important to note that about 15% of kids may present with their very first reaction to a food at school. So that's why it's important that you understand what it looks like and how to identify it and then how to treat it. What's very interesting about food allergies is that we know that 90% of all reactions to foods are caused by eight major foods or food groups. Leading that group is milk and eggs. Then we see peanuts. We see tree nuts as a class. Those are things like pecans, walnuts, cashews, almonds, hazelnuts, those sorts of things. Wheat, soy, and then we see finned fish, so catfish, codfish, tilapia, etc. And then shellfish, and in particular crustacean shellfish. So those would be shrimp, lobster, crab, crawfish, those types of things. Most kids will outgrow most food allergies. The ones that are more persistent are the foods like peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Somewhere between 5 and 20% of kids will outgrow those allergies if they're diagnosed young. We often see them begin to outgrow them by school age if they're going to outgrow the allergy. That doesn't mean they're always going to know because often people don't show up for follow-up appointments. They may maintain these diagnoses for long periods of time. Um, so, but we do think certainly with these uh, certain allergens, they're going to be more persistent, and we'll see those in our adult population. These also happen to be the allergens that are more commonly associated with more severe reactions. So if you have a peanut, fish, or shellfish, or tree nut allergic kid in school, they're the ones that we really want to be very careful about what we're feeding them in school. The other allergens, like wheat and soy, we think that most of those kids are going to outgrow those allergies. What we've seen is that about 50% will outgrow those between 6 and 8 years old, with the majority outgrowing by 8 to 10 years of age. Um, previous data suggested that it might be earlier. We don't know for sure exactly when it is, but we do think it's somewhere between the ages of 5 and 10. The majority of kids allergic to wheat and soy are, are going to outgrow those allergies. Again, that's not gluten intolerance or celiac disease. This is IgE-mediated or immediate reactivity to wheat. So the same types of picture a kid can have to peanut, they can also have to wheat. And I've seen some very severe reactions to wheat. They're typically kids that aren't in school yet, but we do see very severe reactions to wheat. Milk and egg also commonly outgrown. We used to say by school age we think they're more persistent now with about 50% outgrowing somewhere between the ages of 10 and 12. So the majority by 12 and 16 years of age will have outgrown their milk and egg allergies. A lot of them, again, are going to outgrow at early in elementary school, but you may have some high school students that continue to be milk and egg allergic. So now what do we do to care for these kids with life-threatening food allergies? What do I tell them in my clinic? And then how can you care for them at school? We start off in our clinic with nutrition consult. A lot of these kids, you may have noticed, especially if they have multiple food allergies, are often shorter than their peers. And so we know that kids who either have two or more food allergies or who are milk allergic, they're statistically uh, smaller than other kids their age uh, without food allergies. So we like to make sure their nutritional needs are being met. Uh, this may mean if your kid is allergic to milk, maybe they can drink soy milk. We know that soy milk often provides really great protein, fat content that's equivalent and also fortified with calcium and vitamin D. So we really want to make sure that our kids who are milk allergic especially are getting that supplementation some other way besides soda, water or orange juice, which I hear all the time in clinic. That's not, that's not okay. We want to have them having something else besides those types of drinks. We have them provide food allergy action plans. Um, I know that DISD has developed a standard one. You'll see different ones uh, out there. Parents may bring food allergy action plans to you. They're available online at foodallergy.org. Um, the action plan itself just tells you how to recognize a life-threatening food-induced reaction, which we'll go over in just a minute, and then how to treat it based on what symptoms you see. And so it's a, it's a very clear, written-out, step-by-step uh, algorithm of how to treat a food-induced reaction. I ask my patients to get medical alert bracelets. How many get them? Not very many, I don't think, actually get them. But I want them to have them. The, the medical alert bracelets nowadays, they do make some that don't look like you're a 60-year-old diabetic. You know, they don't have the 
They have the cute ones that have soccer balls and that sort of thing on them. So we do ask the kids to get medical alert bracelets. It does help. An example I always give is um, actually of a, of a not a child, but an adult. I saw an anesthesiology resident at the hospital who was allergic to walnuts. Didn't tell anyone she was allergic to walnuts. On her break from the OR, went downstairs to the cafeteria in Parkland, grabbed a cookie, ate the cookie on the way back up from the from the cafeteria, walked into the OR and said, I feel funny and passed out. Um, and had just enough time to tell them I, I'm allergic to nuts. It's the news she's having anaphylaxis. But had she not told them in that brief minute before she passed out, no one would have had any idea what happened to her or why she was passing out. So if you have kids in high school especially, they're the worst about taking chances and, and telling you what's wrong with them. So you want to talk to their families about considering medical or bracelets if possible. And then quality of life issues, we really spend a lot of time on that in our clinic. The reason being that, that you can have both ends of the spectrum. You can have parents who completely ignore it. It's not a big deal. They're going to be okay. And you can have other parents who think it's everywhere and they're going to die any minute. So we really try to, to balance out the, the reality of what it means to have a food allergy. The kids have to ingest the allergen to have a life-threatening reaction. So what does that mean? Well, they can be in the same room as peanut butter. Peanut butter is not aerosolized. But the smell may certainly cause anxiety, so be, be aware of that and be sympathetic towards that. When they're having anxiety or panic type of attacks, it feels like anaphylaxis. If any of you have ever had that before, you feel like your throat's closing, you feel like you can't breathe. And so certainly you can have that type of response triggered. So we need to certainly be sympathetic, we need to be aware, we need to know if they ingested it, we need to really take an extra level of precaution than if it was just in the environment, okay? And we want families to anticipate but not expect reactions. What I mean by that is I want them to be ready at all times. I want the kids to have EpiPens available everywhere they go. Okay, so they need to be in an unlocked location. They need to be nearby. Our teenagers need to be carrying them, need to be aware of how to use them properly and when to use them. But they don't need to think every time they're anywhere that they're going to react. Okay, they need to know the reality of what it means to react, what a reaction looks like and feels like, and how to prepare for one in case one does occur. The chances of being killed by a food allergen are very rare. It's more likely you'll be struck by lightning. But you guys know that if one happens, it hits the news and it's all over, and all of a sudden that's the fear and the perception. So we want to be very careful, but understand it is very rare to have a life-ending response to food, but it is possible. Um, so we want to be ready for that. Obviously, this seems like an obvious choice, right? Avoid the food allergen. Know how to avoid it, but, but unfortunately, it can be very difficult. And for certain allergens, you don't expect them to be in places that you would ordinarily eat and not, not be afraid of. Things like peanut butter may show up at a chili cook-off as a thickener um, and be put in the, in the chili. We might see peanut butter in Rice Krispie treats. Um, anytime a kid goes into a bakery, they can use those, or, or an ice cream shop, they can use the scoops to scoop the gummy bears and the peanut at the same time and cross-contaminate. So we have to be aware of cross-contamination, of things that might show up that, that the kids weren't ready for, um, and be ready to treat in case that happens. Cross-reacting foods also are something we spend a lot of time talking to families about. If I have a kid that the mom comes in and says he reacted to a walnut, he had a walnut and he had a reaction, can I eat other nuts, is that okay? He said cashews, he's done okay. I think you need anything else. Probably not. Pecans and walnuts cross-react very closely. So just because the kid has tolerated cashews doesn't mean he's going to tolerate every other tree nut. So we really try to spend time educating families on if you're allergic to this food, how likely it is you're allergic to another food. And then we do testing to help to understand if it's an actual allergy or not. And then treating the allergen, uh, the reaction with uh, auto-injectable epinephrine, if needed, is very important and is something that we spend a lot of time talking to families about. So when do we treat a food-induced reaction with epinephrine? When do you recognize that response? I want to go over with you right now what an EpiPen looks like. I know all of you have these or have seen them. This is the trainer. Um, the way I tell families to recognize the reaction, again, it's on the action plan. It goes through step by step. What does the reaction look like? If it looks like this, what do I give? And the choices are either an antihistamine like Benadryl or Zyrtec or epinephrine, okay? So what I usually tell families when they're in the heat of the moment, if the kid accidentally has the food, they probably won't be able to find that handout that tells them how to respond. So you need to have in your head exactly what do I do when I see what. I use the neck as a cutoff. What does that mean? If I see a kid who just has a few bumps, so a little urticaria on his face, a little angioedema, a little sniffling, I'm okay with that. I'll give him some Benadryl. I'll watch him very closely. Benadryl takes 30 to 45 minutes to come on. It's not going to stop anaphylaxis. It's just going to make the kid feel better. So don't feel like you're treating the reaction with Benadryl, okay? You're just making them more comfortable. 
If anything is going on below the neck, if the kid is starts to <clears throat> clear their throat, they start to cough, they start to talk a little funny or hoarse, they start to really scratch at their neck, they start coughing or wheezing, they start vomiting, not just once. If they vomit once, I like that. They get an allergen out. But if they vomit once, they look really pale and puny, they're vomiting more than once. Or if the hives are spreading quickly over their whole body or they're becoming very flush, anything's going on, the whole body's involved, I'm going to give the EpiPen. Okay, I want you to not be afraid to give this. If you're thinking, oh my gosh, what's the neck? What, what, was, what was the deal with the neck? I don't remember. Just give the EpiPen, okay? It's, it's safe. It's adrenaline. I'm never going to fault you for it. People are always like, oh, I went to the ER and the ER doctor told me I shouldn't have given it. I'll tell you it was okay, okay? I'm, I'm happy when you give this. It's a safe medicine. It's effective. The side effects are very few. And if you give this, you're going to prevent a life-threatening reaction in most cases, okay? This is the best medicine we have. So how does it work? I'm going to put this down, and if you can't hear me, let me know. Or maybe I should stand here. Okay, so here's your EpiPen. It's got a blue uh, cap on it. It's got an orange tip. I say blue to the sky, orange to the thigh, okay? If you can remember that. Take the blue cap. Hold it in your fist like this. I don't want you to hold it like this. Why? Because parents all the time hold it upside down and inject their fingers, okay? <laughs> Not helpful. So you want to hold it like a fist, just like that. Take that blue cap off and just apply it to the thigh here and just a forceful little jab like that. You notice I didn't do this, okay? We don't have to stab. You don't, you don't have to hurt the child. Um, they're going to be crying anyway. So you just want to take it off. A very gentle, forceful thing right here to the, the largest part of that muscle, the outer thigh. Hold it there for about five to ten seconds. Take it off. When you take it off, the cap is going to come out and protect the needle, okay? Then you want to rub the thigh, rub that area, call 911, send the kid to the hospital. I understand some of you, uh, some of the schools in Yale's district don't have nurses available. You want to know exactly how to activate the emergency response plan as soon as you see that happening. So have the EMS arrive immediately. Have them come take over. And uh, I've had parents say the EMS was afraid to give epi. Encourage them if the kids have a reaction to give epi. We don't want we would want that to be a, a fearful thing. The other thing to be aware of, which I don't have a slide, it's a rec it's a new device coming out, so you may start to see it in schools. The EpiPen has had the market for the past 20 years and hasn't had much competition. There's a twin jack out there some of you may have seen. It's not commonly used, um, and it's even, used even less now than it, than it used to be. Um, but the EpiPen's the main one you're going to see, but I, I expect in the next year you're going to see the other device. It's called AuvyQ. I don't like the name, but it's A-U-V-I-Q. And if you go to their website, it's, Santa Fe is the, the, uh, the manufacturer. Um, they have a video on there that's really cool and shows you what the device looks like. The device itself was developed by two twin brothers who both have food allergies. Um, they're about my age and decided in high school they had a better idea for the EpiPen uh, than EpiPen did. And that they would, one of the twins would go to get his PhD in engineering and the other would go to medical school and get his PhD in immunology. So, I mean, these guys were thinking way ahead. And they developed this project, uh, product called AviQ. What it is, it's the size of a credit card. So, uh, we're hopeful our adolescents will be more ready to wear it. You don't even see it. You can put it in your pocket. As soon as you take it out, you take the cap off, it starts talking to you. It's got a recorded voice in there that says, place on the thigh. You don't have to swing at all. You just put it there. It's got an automatic injector, and it automatically injects. It requires very little effort. It tells you what to do and what it's doing. And then it immediately withdraws the needle, hides it. You never see a needle. and says, call 911, so you don't have to think about it. Um, so I think that the product's probably going to do pretty well. So you're going to probably start seeing it in schools. Just look at that online. I don't have a trainer. I would have brought one. But it's released at the end of January. Um, so you may start to see those before too long. Peanut allergy. I put this slide up here. Like I said, any food can cause an allergic reaction. But certainly we have those eight that are most common. And peanut allergy seems to be the one that induces the most anxiety, the most fear, the one you see the most in the news. And it's the one that can be one of the most dangerous. So what I like to remind health providers uh, and families when we're looking at peanut allergy is that to have a, an immediate uh, life-threatening reaction, you have to ingest the allergen uh, to have that severe reaction. Now the question is, what if I'm on a plane and somebody's opening peanut products? You can certainly have the induction of peanut dust is in the air. You can have... Uh, some bronchospasm, have some asthma attacks, it's unlikely to lead to life-threatening reaction. Again, the smell of peanut butter can be anxiety-provoking, but peanut butter is not aerosolized. You have to have that protein ingested to have the life-threatening reaction. 
Um, touch typically will cause localized reactions. We'll see the kids who accidentally touch peanut butter will get hives wherever they touched it. If someone else touches it, then touches them. They may have hives wherever they were touched. Um, and then smell, again, as I've mentioned, isn't life-threatening, but certainly can cause anxiety, and we need to be uh, sympathetic towards that when that happens. So what about SB 27? Um, this was a big move. Uh, as Suzanne mentioned, it's been in the legislature for a long time, uh, and I think is the right move, uh, was, was garnered with support from all the food allergy organizations, from school nurses, from school principals. It was a committee that encompassed every facet of who all was affected, and I feel like we came up with a good guideline. Uh, the, it was passed last May, was um, enacted or implemented in August, and it applies only to public schools and charter schools. So for those of you who have friends who are in private schools, this doesn't apply to them, but it is certainly for DISD. And as we've been talking about, it applies for kids at risk for anaphylaxis. So the kids, the life-threatening food allergies, not the food intolerances. And the full guidelines are available online. That's in your handout, and you can go and read the whole document if you want. It can be overwhelming. It's about 65 pages, but almost all of it is examples. So the first uh, few pages are background, and then it tells you a little bit about the policy. It has a whole lot of examples of things that school districts can um, implement. There are also things that aren't necessarily mandates but encouraged. One of those is that it encourages the superintendent to designate a single employee as a contact person um, that helps to oversee the development of the food allergy management team and the food allergy management plan on the campus. The team can be anyone and we encourage when we were writing this specifically to include people from all over the school because the kids can be in any place. So we ask for cafeteria staff, for schools, for school nurses, um, for bus drivers, etc. Anyone can be on the food allergy management team. And those people help to support the students on campus and then help to make sure the procedures are implemented and also provide a point of contact for the families when they come to school and have questions. Um, we ask for a focus on environmental controls and just really an awareness of what that means. We're trying to encourage teachers to get away from having foods in the classroom, so less peanut butter bird houses uh, and more projects that don't include foods. Even Play-Doh has wheat in it, wheat flour. So we really ask that they try to get away from any project in the classroom that has food involved and to use non-food types of projects. We ask them to keep foods particularly in the cafeteria and not to include foods in the, in the classroom, but that's not mandated, it's just requested. And then we ask for training for school personnel on food allergy uh, awareness. And that is uh, something that is uh, not just recommended, but is part of the, of the plan. So what does that mean? You know, you guys are getting to, to see me today. Sorry about that, but if you don't, don't like what I have to say, you can go to the allergyready.com website and learn more. Uh, that is a website that we're excited about because it, it provides access for kids, for nurses who are in, let's say, West Texas and don't have access uh, to some of the teaching sessions, um, or even for families, for teachers, for anyone that wants to learn more about food allergy, about how to recognize an allergic reaction, they can go to this website, watch a video, it has some good information. A question I often get from school nurses especially is what about uh, non-student specific epinephrine? Um, what do we do about that? Uh, there is no mandate for non-student specific epinephrine. Why? Because the bill required that there was not any fiscal note attached to the bill. Um, that being said, uh, DISD has, has plans in place for how the families will provide epinephrine. I don't believe you will have non-student specific epinephrine, which makes it even more important that you recognize the reaction and that you call 911 as soon as you recognize the reaction. Um, we do ask, and I want you to pay particular attention in your schools of where the epinephrine is kept. It needs to be safe, but we ask that it's unlocked. Why? Because maybe you're not at the cabinet whenever the kid needs the epinephrine. So the teachers, the care providers for that kid need to know where to get the epinephrine immediately, and we ask that it's in an, an unlocked, accessible location. So what are the school's responsibilities? And Emily's going to go into more detail specifically for you guys. I just wanted you guys to see the types of things I'm telling families. I see kids from all over Texas, and so they may be in school districts besides DSD. I ask them to be knowledgeable. The schools need to be knowledgeable about uh, and follow applicable federal laws. Um, again, that's uh, not applying to some of the private schools, but for public schools and charter schools, they have to comply with SB 27. The health records need to be reviewed. And so, uh, again, with what Suzanne was saying earlier, with your health intake forms, uh, the parents have to fill those out. You can't guess 
for the families. So we have to have cooperation from the families uh, in addition to having careful review once that's submitted of what's on the health record. We want to understand that all staff who interact with the students uh, understand what a food allergy is, what it looks like, what's the life-threatening food allergy. They know how to recognize symptoms that we've mentioned already um, and that they know what to do in an emergency. So like I mentioned, you know what to do, how to recognize it, you know how to get the epinephrine, but you also know how to, how to trigger that emergency response team and get the EMS service there immediately. And you want to make sure that all those who work with the students work with other school staff. So a big um, concern for my parents is what about substitute teachers? And we asked the, the primary teacher that's taking care of that kid with food allergy to provide a folder for the substitute teacher. And I really encourage the parents to prepare that for them. So one of my nurses has a kid with food allergies, and what she always does is makes a neon folder that specifically outlines her kid's allergic to milk and tells the substitute teacher exactly how to recognize a reaction, that sort of thing. I think it's good to have those sorts of resources available. The school needs to be prepared to handle a reaction, and that's why you're here. You're understanding what is a food allergy, how to uh, treat one should one occur, and then coordination between the teachers and the school nurse about appropriately storing the epinephrine, as we mentioned. And then the question is, what about students who want to carry their own epinephrine? That's not a call I can make. That's not a, a law that's out there. Um, that's something you have to work with the families and parents to understand if the child is old enough and mature enough to carry their own epinephrine. And, and if you have a child that you're like, you know, this kid seems really young to be carrying it, then what I want you to do, what I do in clinic, is I make sure they know how to use the trainer appropriately and they can voice to me when they're going to give it to themselves. So if they're mature enough to do that, then I'm personally okay with them having their epinephrine with them. If they don't know why they would give it, if they don't know what symptoms to think about when they would use it, and they don't know how to use it properly, then they're not old enough to have it with them. Okay, so, so that's kind of my, my general rule and cutoff of when to use it and when to not. So what are the parents' responsibilities? Well, I tell my parents that they have to be the ones to notify you of what their kids' food allergies are. They can't make you guess, and they can't wait till a reaction occurs at school. If they know the kid is allergic, they need to let you know that the kid may have a reaction. So they have to notify you of the allergies. Ask them to provide labeled medicines and replace those medicines once they're expired. I know that's going to be challenging for you all. You probably have a dozen expired EpiPens laying around. They expire pretty quickly. If you have a family that just went to the pharmacy or is about to go to the pharmacy and get their EpiPen, tell them to check the date before they leave the pharmacy. Oftentimes the pharmacist, perhaps uh, not even thinking about it, maybe they're trying to clean up the stock on the shelf. I don't know. I don't judge that. But you want the families to make sure that they're talking to the pharmacist to see when it expires. They should not pick one up from the pharmacy that expires in less than a year. They should always have them last at least a year, and often they'll last longer than that. They need to provide you emergency contact information. You need to know who to call in case the kid reacts. And I know you guys have that for many reasons, uh, but they have to make sure they're giving that to you. I hear laugh, so maybe you're not getting that. Um, they have to educate the child in self-management of the food allergy. What does that mean? Of course, that differs depending on the development and the age of the child. I want the kids to recognize what are safe and unsafe foods. They can't begin too early doing that. Um, but certainly, I, I tell them it's like driver's ed for the kids. You're going to have the brake on the, on the driver's side, on the passenger side, while you're letting them practice driving. So you want the parents to be present. You want to be present as the kid begins to take ownership for his own disease. Help them to understand what is safe and what is unsafe. Don't make jokes about it. I had a family come in and tell me of a, of a, a daycare where the, the daycare teacher was, was joking with the peanut allergic kid, oh, this, this cookie has peanuts. No, I'm just kidding, it doesn't. It's not funny, okay? Don't do that. It, it's dangerous. It's, it's, it's the equivalent of saying to a kid, here's a knife, go play with it. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not something to joke around with the kids about or the families about. So we want you to be very serious when dealing with the allergies and telling the kids what are safe and unsafe foods. I want them to understand strategies for avoiding exposure to unsafe foods. Um, in other words, uh, you know, washing hands between meals. All the kids can wash their hands after they eat their food. Not sharing food. Making sure the kid is, if they brought their lunch, they're eating just their lunch. If they're eating from the cafeteria, making sure that it is a plate that has been checked and we know that it's safe for the kid. Understanding the symptoms of allergic reactions, again, letting the kid understand what does it look like when I have a reaction, what do I do when I uh, feel like I'm having a reaction. 
really understanding that communication piece and knowing how and when to tell an adult they may be having the problem is very important. And then as the kids get older, we want them to read food labels. There are food labeling laws passed in the U.S. that say all of the top eight allergens must be listed on any food manufactured in the U.S. on the label in plain English. So that means it can't say casein or whey anymore and mean milk. It has to say milk if milk is in the food. That doesn't mean it's going to be bold and at the bottom of the label. It may be buried in the ingredient label, but you have to be careful when you read ingredient labels. Make sure that food is safe. We want the families to form a team. So what does that mean? We want the parents to schedule the meeting. you all like the dog. We want the, the parents to schedule a meeting with the child's teacher and with their food allergy management team designee. Um, we want the parents to bring copies of not only the school's food allergy policy. Why? Because I want them to know that they're aware of what's in it. I want them to be involved in the process. But I also want them to bring documentation from a physician that says what the food allergy is. The family doesn't have that. Now, it doesn't mean you can say, well, this isn't a real allergy. But I do want you to encourage them to get documentation from the doctor so that you do have a doctor's signature that verifies, yeah, this is real. Okay, that It's not that they just don't like potatoes. They're really allergic to milk and that's in mashed potatoes often so they can't have things that contain milk or they maybe really are allergic to potatoes you can be allergic to potatoes but you need to have documentation from the physician that says that's real we want them to have a team what does the team approach mean we want them to together discuss items with you we want them to know how to help the child avoid accidental exposure it can be difficult so they need to to help you understand how to do that they need to help you um, understand how to recognize the symptoms of reaction uh, I, I always encourage the parents to ask where the medications are stored. I think that it's within their right to know where that's stored and what the plan is on how to get it should they need it. They need to be sure everyone knows how to properly use an EpiPen. And so I encourage the families to take trainers with them. Uh, and if the provider they're talking to doesn't know, go over with them and teach them how to use it. And they need to know that what the school is going to do in the event of reaction. That was the point of this SB27. That was the point of the policy you guys are implementing. It's so you'll know what to do. So what are our take home points? Number one, identify your food allergic kids. And this is something we can discuss more in detail with your specific questions. But it is important to know exactly who has the life threatening food allergies and what are we going to do to care for those kids. Know those signs and symptoms of a reaction. Again, what are those react? What are those signs and symptoms? It's going to be urticaria, angioedema, can be difficulty breathing, talking or swallowing, coughing or wheezing, repetitive vomiting, or to carry a spreading quickly, the kids starting to pass out, look faint. Think of a food allergy, especially if they just ate. Occurs within two hours of ingestion, almost always within 30 minutes to 45 minutes of ingestion, but always within two hours. So if it's more than that, you're going to think of something else. But if it's within that time frame, you want to be aware of a food allergy. You want to know how to use the EpiPen and know where to keep it, where it's stored. Uh, we went over that. If you have more questions, be happy to, to show you how to use that again. And you want to know how to activate your emergency response system. So how do we get EMS uh, involved? How close by are they? And how responsive are they? You want to know exactly what the process is for making that happen. And you want the open dialogue to occur with your parents of the food allergic kids. And I know that oftentimes um, it can feel like it's you're butting heads against them. What we encourage all our parents to do is to really come in, not with a, an agenda and not with their fingers pointing, but with an open discussion. Uh, And so I ask that that you be uh, empathetic to to that, that these parents are scared, especially the kids that are going into kindergarten and first grade. The kids have always been under the watchful, close eye of their parents. And so it is an anxious time for all parents sending their kids to kindergarten, but especially for these families whose kids have life-threatening allergies. And so it gives you a chance to open that dialogue, to really share education, to get them involved. We want these parents involved as room mothers. We want them involved We don't want them to hover around and just be over the kids. And I know some of my parents go to school with their kids every day to eat lunch. I don't want that. I want them to start to let go and and loosen up. But but the way that that happens is when there's a trust involved. And so I want you guys to be able to develop that trust. And the way to develop that trust is really having that knowledge of knowing what they're talking about when they're talking about it. You can exchange ideas, and you can then be involved in caring for that child. I think we all have the same goal in mind. It's to keep the kids safe. Uh, and often our anxiety comes from not knowing. So I hope that by, by this discussion we can, we can begin to know more about food allergy and that certainly when you have that discussion with the family, you can feel more confident about what you're saying and what you know. And reinforce that it's a team approach to caring for the kids and educating the staff. You're not doing this by yourself. The teacher's not by herself. 
There's a group of you that are concerned for the child's health, and you all want to do what is best for the child. So I've listed on the uh, back, the last slide there, some different resources. The first one is our website at Children's. Uh, We have some links to things like avoidance worksheets, that sort of thing that tell you how to avoid the foods. Foodallergy.org is the FAN website, uh, and FAI USA is the Food Allergy Initiative website. Those are both advocacy organizations for kids and families with food allergy. They've recently joined uh, together to be one large organization that focuses on advocacy and research. Uh, But their website, you know, if you do a Google search or go to a blog, you're going to find a lot of junk. So I like these websites. They really have trusted information that has been reviewed by experts that is reliable. And that's what we really want is reliable facts. Okay. And then allergyready.com is the one I mentioned earlier to you all that has the education on how to treat a food-induced allergic reaction, how to recognize the symptoms, and what to do. And then SB27 guidelines are online uh, at dshs.state.texas.us, and there's the full address if you want to review that in more detail. So um, that's all the slides I have. So if you guys have questions, I'm happy at this time uh, to answer anything you may ask. Yes. I sure can, yep. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So her question is one I'm sure a lot of you um, deal with, and it's the question of what do you do with the families that are indifferent um, or don't care or won't get involved. Um, and that is a global problem, and I know it's a problem not just with food allergy, but also with your asthmatics and with your diabetics and with a lot of other diseases, and I wish I had the answer for that. I don't really know. You know, the, the, the way that we approach it for those families, of course, the families I see are the ones who are typically very concerned. Um, I don't see the ones who are not concerned as often, obviously. They come to me because they, they are really concerned about the food allergies. So how do you approach that? I think that the best way to approach that always is never to – you know, a little human interaction, common sense stuff, but don't talk down to them. Really encourage them to open up, to, to tell you what do they understand of the, food, the kid's food allergy. So if they say he's allergic to peanuts, he had a bad reaction, it's fine. Well, if this is your chance to say, well, maybe it's not. You know, peanut allergy can be very dangerous. We have several kids in our school who have life-threatening reactions to peanut, and you can't tell, and I can't tell, and I talked to a doctor who said none of us can tell if the kid's next reaction is going to be life-threatening, and that's the truth. None of us know if a kid who has a minor allergy. There's no such thing as a minor allergy to peanut. There are so many things that go into the severity of the reaction. I can't predict from one reaction to the next how severe it's going to be. So tell them, this could be life-threatening. You need to take your kid to see a doctor. I want you to be prepared. I need to know how to care for your kid at school and keep him safe. And really just try to educate them, inform them. If you have some of this information that you can give to them, I think that's helpful. But I always think education and information is empowering. And that's the way you get people involved and really keep that communication open. And that will hopefully get them to take more recognition and ownership for the child's problems. Uh huh. Yeah, so her question is, what about when you don't get EpiPen, you just get Benadryl for the child? That's right. And, yeah. So, so her question is, you know, what about the kids, like I mentioned, that have the severe reactions but previously had a minor reaction? Is Benadryl enough? Um, and that is not a, a choice you need to make as the school nurse. That needs to come from the doctor. Mom encourages the doctors to have the uh, the documentation of what the child needs for treatment because there are kids with food allergies that don't need EpiPens. Every kid with a food allergy doesn't mean automatically EpiPen. The life-threatening reactions typically come from peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. can come from milk and eggs and wheat and soy. We do see it sometimes. But every kid with an egg allergy may not have an EpiPen, and that's not wrong. But the difference has to come from the doctor. The doctor has to provide documentation for what they need. It's not the parent's call to say, oh, it's just Benadryl, it's fine. They need the note from the doctor to, to help. Uh, yes, ma'am. Before today, I
That's right. That's right. Yeah. So her question is, uh, you know, I, I used to think it, Epi was just for when the breathing problems were there, and now you've said that it's if the hives are all over, I should give it. And you also probably see kids with hives all over all the time. Um, and so when do I give Epi, when do I not? What are the side effects, and how quickly should I expect to see a response? So this, again, is for your kids with known food allergies who have ingested the allergen. So the kid was in the cafeteria, accidentally got some milk. All of a sudden, they've come, and they have hives all over. They'll commonly have other symptoms. So I rarely see a kid that just has hives and doesn't have also either the runny nose, the coughing, the clearing the throat. It's often all together. But if you do have the kid that just has hives, what do you do? I say give epi. Why? Because the reaction may progress, and we don't know. We know as soon as we start to see systemic symptoms that it's more likely the reaction is going to progress to something more serious. Epinephrine is safe, effective, and works quickly. How quickly? Within minutes. So within five minutes, you should see a significant response. You shouldn't see the kid getting worse. If you're giving the epi, you should have already called 911, and they should be on their way. So, so you're going to get to turn your hands off the kid pretty soon. Um, but you should see pretty quickly. What types of side effects do you see? Increased heart rate, though it's not to the point to where the kid's heart's beat out of their chest, like you'll sometimes see in your asthmatics who have been on albuterol nebs for a while. These are kids who, who they will have increased heart rate, but they're so nervous, you're nervous, everyone's heart rate's up a little bit when this is going on. So, so you give the epi. Again, I think that the fear from it comes when you think of that jabbing, oh my gosh, this is so violent. Really, it doesn't require that. With, that. with the trainers that you have, just practice that motion. It's a very gentle, quick motion that requires that to go in. You pull it away, the needle's gone. Um, will a parent yell at you? Maybe. They may. They may. I mean, they're not all seeing me, and I'm, all the doctors aren't telling them the same thing I'm telling them. Um, I'm telling you what, what is defendable and what is also what I consider best practice and in the best interest of the child, and that is to prevent the reaction from progressing. And we know that the EpiPen, if given early and quickly, prevents the reaction from getting worse and will treat it. And we know with, with urticaria, it's going to resolve pretty quickly after you give the epinephrine and get better. So that's my, my take. Yes. Was it, yep, I think she said Yeah, so the question was, if a parent suspects a food allergy, are there tests that can be given? And there are. Um, the tests that are out there, you may have heard them referred to as RAST tests. Um, it's IgE testing. It's no longer used. The RAST method is no longer used, but it's, well, it's been referred to by doctors for a long, long time. But it, it's IgE testing. IgE is that allergic antibody that looks to see um, if you have a chance of having a severe reaction to the food, you will have IgE present. Now, that doesn't mean that every child that has IgE to a food has a food allergy. There's a lot of false positives on these tests. And so it all interpretation of the test depends on the level of the IgE and also the history of the child. So if I get a panel of IgE tests and all of us, we're all going to have positive. It's not going to mean anything. And so it does require interpretation by a physician that's familiar with how to interpret the test. Um, in addition, in the allergist office, we'll often do skin testing where we just prick the skin with a drop of oil from the food um, or a solubilized portion of the food and then look for a hive or urticarial response at that site. If we're not sure on that, then as physicians, we will then go to uh, an observed food challenge that's almost always done in an allergist office, so not in just any office because they can be have severe reactions. Now, that, those are the tests that are validated, that are useful, that are helpful, that have been confirmed to give good responses. That's not all the tests out there. And I know you guys get a list of kids with food allergy that have had all sorts of testing done. So none of the other tests have been validated, okay? IgG testing, not validated. These leak diets or the mixed things, the colorful charts that the families come in with, those aren't validated. It's not uh, proven to, to be effective or helpful to avoid those foods. Uh, a lot of the... Um, electrophysiology, the uh, hair testing, um, things along these lines, not uh, proven to be in any way uh, conclusive for diagnosing a life-threatening food allergy. Okay, so again, remembering you're, you're responsible for those kids with life-threatening food allergy based on SB27, um, you don't need to be responsible for interpreting the multitude of tests out there. 
Um, but if, you're, if a family comes to you with that type of, of chart or test, you need to really have physician uh, letter that explains how to interpret that because the, the only ones that are used for interpretation of life-threatening food allergies are the IgE test and the skin test. Yes, ma'am. Fish, I have a question. I had a parent that sent a form back. Didn't call, I mean, didn't come in. I got it like three weeks after school started, and she said uh, the smell of fish. The child's allergic to fish and the smell of fish. Of course, I'm trying to get, you know, get a hold of her, find out. School's already been in session. We have fish served. And then she said, when I got a hold of her, she said, oh, she said, there's nothing to worry about in school. She said, the kids, you know, eat cooked fish. And she said, it's they just, she can't go and be around uh, someplace where they're having a fish fry. Right. So, so is that true or not? So so that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I think in my effort to dispel... I think in my efforts to dispel the myths associated with peanut allergy, I neglect fish allergy. And, and fish and shellfish are exceptions to my rule. So the, the problem with fish and shellfish is that whenever you cook it, the protein is aerosolized often. So if I have a fish allergic child that goes into a kitchen where mom is frying fish, the fish protein can be aerosolized. It can induce a severe reaction. So with fish and shellfish, you have to be, it's different. Now, if, if the lunchroom smells like fish, again, the smell is not. So the mom is right. This, this is a, a mom who knows. You can smell it, yeah, and I really ask my moms of kids with asthma to stop doing that because they often live in these small houses with tiny kitchens and the kids are walking through. But, but the fish and shellfish, um, they don't, the kids obviously, for many reasons, shouldn't be in the kitchen at the school. But, they, but the smell itself can, can induce um, just, the smell will just probably induce the anxiety. But again, if they're close to where it was cooked and it's been aerosolized in the air, it can induce a more severe reaction. So fish and shellfish are your exceptions. Peanut butter, not aerosolized. As long as the kid isn't eating fish, there's no cross-contamination, and, and yeah. But, it, but the, the smell, again, uh, may cause some anxiety, but as long as they're not in the presence of where it's cooked, they should be okay. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yes. Yeah, that's a great question. So her question is, what about the families who can't afford the EpiPens and don't have Medicaid? EpiPens are expensive, and even families who have insurance, their insurance will often only cover a portion of the EpiPen, and it's still over $100. Um, There is a program called EpiPen for Schools, and it's not something you can individually take on yourselves to get, but uh, if you have families in other school districts, et cetera, that can look, there is a a free program for schools to have non-mandated food allergen uh, EpiPen on, on campus. This isn't something for DISD, but it is something to be aware of if you interact with families who are in other places. Uh, that's how they can get it. The other way is to contact the manufacturer. Uh, EpiPen, especially now that there's a competitor on the market, is going to be doing all sorts of things to get your families to use EpiPens. And so um, Day Pharmaceuticals is the pharmaceutical company. If you just search EpiPen, you're going to go to EpiPen.com, and they're going to have coupons available. They'll have any doctor is going to have reps that, that approach them frequently and will have ways for kids to get EpiPens. So uh, EpiPen does not want a kid to be without an EpiPen. And the bottom line is if the family will uh, take some steps to contact the manufacturer, they're very likely to provide at least coupons to get it affordable, if not give um, other ways to, to get the EpiPen for the kid. But, but they should be able to get it. But they're going to have to see a doctor to do that. They can't just uh, do it on their own. Yes? So her question is, how often should the kids get retested for the allergies? Um, it, it depends on the allergy and depends on the kid. For my kids with peanut, tree nut fish, and shellfish allergies, I typically like to see them every two years. The reason being those allergens, the kids don't grow those allergies quickly. They're often lifelong. It doesn't change very frequently in, in a year's time. So every two years I'll see those kids. For kids allergic to milk, eggs, wheat, soy, I like to see them about every year. Uh, if kids are, are doing things, I think they're starting to outgrow the allergy um, or they've tolerated small amounts of the food. Mom said, oh, I gave him a bite of scrambled egg and he did just fine. Um, then I like to see them maybe every six months, but at least every year for the kids who have allergens besides peanuts, tree nuts, fish, and shellfish. Yes, ma'am.
Yeah, so the question is, uh, if I would speak more on intolerance, what does that mean, uh, and how do you treat those kids as compared to those with life-threatening food allergies? And that is difficult. Uh, that, that is not something that you should be responsible for defining the difference, and that is something that the family should have to get the doctor's letter and input to help you understand how to differentiate this. I, I don't think this is something you can rely on a family to say, oh, well, he's intolerant to peppermint, so you know, he can't have peppermint. It turns out he just doesn't like peppermint, you know, things like that. I mean, I think that, that you're often put in a position to try to make diagnoses when you can't do that. And intolerance is not likely to lead to a life-threatening reaction. It's likely to make, uh, it can for some intolerances, for instance, uh, uh, lactose intolerance, those of you who know that, very common, can make very uncomfortable, uh, can cause some real uh, gastrointestinal distress, but not life-threatening reactions. And so uh, in certain cases, for instance, with lactose intolerance, lactose milk should be avoided. You should avoid the food. So if a parent asks for that food to be avoided, um, then you just need documentation of simply what does that mean. Uh, if it's a life-threatening food allergy, they have to have the food allergy action plan available. It has to be signed by a physician that agrees that that is the type of response. If it's just an intolerance, however, you really are going to have to get the documentation from the physician of what that means. So if it means simply that they're intolerant to it, that they may get sick if they have it, uh, it's still going to be in, you know, from, from the parent's wishes and the school's obligation, you're going to have to avoid the food, and they'll have to make accommodations for the child. Um, but it, it's not necessarily the life-threatening types of reactions that we see from some of these other foods, like I mentioned. Uh, and, and I know there are 504 plans out there that, that sometimes family come at, at you with those. We don't encourage 504 plans. The reason is because 504 plans, from our perspective and from our experience, have often caused uh, this headbutting type of, of reaction between families and parents. And so there are cases of kids where I think they need 504 plans. And I have some families I've said, yeah, let's do a 504 plan. It makes sense. Um, but I think when you start the, the exchange with these families and their intolerances, um, or their allergies, very open and very uh, trying to, to see what is the real problem, making sure you have a physician that is signing the notes and telling you what it is. Uh, often you don't get to that point where you have to get a 504 plan and get all these other, other rules involved. Yes? Yeah, well, you can practice with me when you're done. The, the uh, EpiPen, again, the swing is not this, but I think it, it, swing is, to me, is just this. So you can hear the click. It's just a very gentle, um, but you're right, it does say swing on there. It, but it doesn't, to me, that, that's all it takes. It doesn't take the uh, baseball swing. <laughs> we don't, you, know, you don't need... It's very violent. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, if you have the, well, I mean, you know, the way that I do it is really to tell the families, you hold it and you do it. You don't have to bruise the child to do it. You know, it doesn't take this uh, combat type of stance to, to fire it off. But you just want to do just a little, little swing and then you hear the, the click. But, I mean, I think that when you have the families and you practice with it, you get the feel for what it's like. And what I tell families to do as well is when the EpiPen expires, uh, then they want to use those on an orange and get the feel for what the real one feels like to fire off. Because it, it has more kick than this. When you do a real one, it has a spring in it, you feel the, the kick. Um, but it doesn't take more pressure than that. And if they'll use an orange on the expired ones, they can get the feel of what it really feels like to inject that. And like I say, you probably have expired ones in your in your nurse's office that you can, if you'll get the family when they come back, say, hey, can we use this? And together, let's see what it looks like to use the real one. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so the question is, besides the top eight, what about other types of allergies like strawberry? Um, strawberry itself is very, very, very rare. Uh, fruit allergens in general are not as likely to lead to life-threatening reactions, even though they commonly get labeled as food allergens. Um, they'll often cause the reason strawberry, blueberry, lemons, oranges often get labeled as allergens is because they're acidic, and when the child eats them, their face lights up and they get red, and so it gets mislabeled often. Um, and, and if they are allergic when they're young, they commonly outgrow those very early on. So to see a, an older child in school with a strawberry allergy or a corn allergy um, would be quite rare. It's, it certainly isn't the, the rule. 
Uh, so with those kids, again, if the family says he's strawberry allergic and the doctor is signed that he is strawberry allergic and it's life-threatening type of um, reaction, you have to go along with that. You have to have the EpiPen. You have to have the action plan. But the odds of you having to use the EpiPen are extremely low if they're only allergic to strawberries. Another question fa uh, nurses often ask me is, what about my expired EpiPens? What if the family hasn't brought a new one in? Can I still use it? And you can. Okay, they, they've had studies done to look at these EpiPens, how long they last. They're good for years later in normal circumstances when you're not exposing them to extreme heat. Um, they may diminish in efficacy somewhat. But if that's what you have, that's what you need to use. Yes, ma'am. Right. So the question is, what about the district providing milk substitutes? Because um, it's expensive. It's expensive. Um, this is the kids do need milk substitutes, and commonly, most milk allergic kids can have soy milk, and soy milk is not a significantly different cost than cow's milk. Um, but these are, are cases of, of kids who, if the, the um, district can't accommodate for whatever reason, um, the soy milk, maybe an almond milk or a hemp milk works. Oftentimes with these kids, the families will provide it for the kid themselves. If they don't, then, then there does need to be a discussion. I think that I feel that the district is obligated for the school lunch, for the dietitian and the cafeteria staff to provide a reasonable, nutritious alternative for the child. Some of these kids, you're right, are on really expensive formulas. Um, like Neocate and Helicare and these types of things. Families have to provide those, and, and WIC provides that for the family. Um, yeah, their, their Medicaid provides it for the family. So if the kid is on one of these really rare, expensive formulas, then the family uh, has it at home and is maybe getting it through insurance or government assistance, and the conversation should be opened up to please provide that for your kid to have at school as well. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so just as far as when we do food challenges and that sort of thing, is that the question, how, how that's performed and when we do it? Right, so when do we do those? The food challenges we do commonly in kids who've been misdiagnosed with food allergy or they've outgrown their food allergy and we're just not sure. A lot of times the testing, like the IgE testing, we'll see it fall over time, but maybe not go to complete zero. Or we'll see the skin test get smaller, but not get completely negative. And so when we have those kids in the office, that's when we do food challenges. The food challenge involves the kid and the family coming into the clinic uh, for a, about a three hour visit. We divide a serving size portion of the food into six pieces, give those pieces about 10 to 15 minutes apart, and watch the kid to see if they have a reaction. Um, if they have a reaction, we treat it. If they don't, uh, then we consider them uh, no longer allergic, and the family can reintroduce the food at home. Um, if the child has a reaction, we do treat it right there in clinic. That's why we watch the kids for two hours after the last dose of the food is given to make sure no reaction is going to occur. And it is a time for us to educate the families on how to recognize the reaction, how to treat it when it occurs. Is that is that kind of what you were asking? Or, or yeah. They can come to school the next day. Oh, well, so, yeah, that's a tricky question. I get the call sometimes about writing a letter, and I'm like, no, I'm not writing a letter for that. Um, yeah, the, uh, the question is if the kid can come back to school the next day after food challenge. I can't think of a reason why they couldn't be back in school the next day after a food challenge. Um, very rarely will I have a kid who's had pretty bad diarrhea during the challenge. And by rarely, I mean I can count on one hand how often I've had that happen. And it typically resolves by the time, by nighttime. Uh, and certainly the next day shouldn't keep the kid out of school. Um, now, there may be something else going on, but, but a food-induced reaction, again, should not persist for days. The kid may have, you know, often what happens, and the reason I get a lot of these kids is they've had a bad virus, and they had urticaria associated with the virus and were labeled food allergic, and the mom says, oh, it was a food that caused this, and he had hives for a week, but that's not the food that caused that. So, so there are reasons that families will say, oh, it was a food that caused this, and the reaction persisted. They may truly be sick, but it's not because of food allergy. Yes, ma'am. Have you had anybody that's run out of an allergy and then became allergic again to that? So the question is if someone's outgrown an allergy and then become allergic again, and yes, unfortunately we have. If we have a kid, it's, it's rare and it's reportable if it happens, but um, if we have a kid who 
has been avoiding a food for a long time. They come in, they have a challenge. We say, oh, you're no longer allergic to, to peanuts, even though you used to be. You know you used to be, but now you've outgrown it. Um, and the kid says, well, I hate the taste of peanut butter. I'm not going to eat it anymore. Uh, and then they don't eat it. And then a year later, they say, oh, I want to eat it again. Sometimes they'll react. And so if, if I have a kid who was truly allergic at one time, I grew the allergy. I tell the family that if possible, keep it in their diet because they can become resensitized. But if they're going to continue to avoid it, then you have to reconsider if they may become resensitized. And certainly you can develop allergies as an adult. So you can develop sensitivities to things like shellfish and fish, for instance. Uh, we see commonly that as an older adult adol or adolescent, these allergies will appear for the first time in someone who used to tolerate it. Anything else? Yes, That's right. So just she's just asking me to re, reiterate what I, what I said earlier about if you are allergic, then you pass a food challenge. Should you keep it in your diet or not? And, and you can if you don't keep the food in your diet on a regular basis. What does regular mean? I'll say at least a few times a week. It doesn't mean every day, every meal. But if you'll keep it as a part of the diet, you're less likely to then develop a sensitization down the road. Yes. Yeah, just so you're just wondering about if the kids just search something that's not not served at school anyway. Yeah, and I think it's kind of like your strawberry allergy. It's a kid that you know they have a known allergy. It's shellfish. They have the epipen at school. That's fine. You're not going to likely need to use it. So I, I mean, I think that it's just it takes your level of concern down a bit when you have a kid allergic to something that's not in the school. But I think that it still warrants having it just in case something random were to happen and the, the fish sticks got mixed up with the fried shrimp in the plant and nobody knew it was going to happen and then the kid accidentally got, got fried shrimp. And I think that it's, it's fine to have that. Anything else? That's right. That's right. Kids will bring all sorts of things in their lunches to school. And so if they do accidentally share something, you can certainly have that reaction. I, that may not be happening in all schools, but yeah, if lobster was brought to school, then that could be a problem. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, what different types of reactions can you have and, and things that may not look typical? With a food allergy, again, the life-threatening food allergy is the kids that, that we want you guys to be prepared for and to recognize. They're most commonly going to present with urticaria, with the hives that are all over. Um, you will have kids who develop eczema-type reactions to foods, um, and those kids can also have life-threatening allergies, but again, the eczema flare is not a sign of immediate food-induced anaphylaxis. Uh, eczema by itself is not. And then you may have kids with like celiac disease who develop blistering herpetiform types of lesions on their elbows and on their knees. Those aren't um, life-threatening types of reactions, but are still rashes you can see related to foods. And you can have kids have asthma attacks if they have asthma that are minor that aren't related to food. You can have a kid that's not asthmatic that has wheezing and coughing associated as part of their uh, disease presentation. So the important thing or take-home point for you guys is just to keep in mind who are our kids who have food-induced allergies that we know about? 
What do we look for when they have that food? And for the kid who appears after eating with some of these symptoms, be thinking in your mind, could this be food allergy? And if so, how do I treat it? All right. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and begin with uh, Emily, and she's going to go over our food allergy plan here in the district. presentation by Dr. Berg, so we really appreciate that. Uh, my part of the presentation is to talk about how to build a food allergy plan. Uh, Dr. Bird mentioned that um, the Senate Bill 27 ad hoc committee um, gave guidelines for food allergies, and the guidelines are to get um, school districts to be able to um, set up a policy to administer care for children with uh, food allergies at risk for anaphylaxis. I'm supposed to be turning this on. Okay. And our school board um, voted uh, approved board policy FFAF local referencing um, the food allergy plan. We have other policies that are listed that deal with food allergies. An integrated approach through multidisciplinary collaboration is important for that. Um, whoops. Is important for the implement, implementation of the food allergy plan. Tools are available for nurses to uh, develop and communicate, implement, and monitor our food allergy plans. And as Suzanne said, part of the law is that each April, we're going to review our plans both on a district level, but then also nurses who have children who have food allergies. And that way we hope to have uh, maintain a current uh, plan for the children. The multidisciplinary group is going to be the parent and guardian, food services, campus administrator, teachers, 504 lead person, uh, our safety coordinator, custodial staff, bus drivers, and other people on the campus. The tools that we have here in the district uh, to support the food allergy development is the health history. We all are familiar with that. Our new form, the health history, the food allergy health history. Our anaphylactic allergy reaction emergency algorithm. Our food allergy emergency care plan. Our individual health care plan. The new form, uh, the H72 for food allergies, which is built on our uh, medication um, form that we're all familiar with. A planning checklist for food allergies, and then a post-anaphylactic uh, event debriefing tool. 
So let's look at the difference between the H2 and the food allergy health history. Now, Suzanne sent out an email asking that you all perhaps bring the tools with you. So if you want to look at them, feel free to, because we're going to be working through them. I'm not going to go through every tool for you and um, read it, spoon feed it to you. But go ahead and look at them. Um, on our H70, I mean our H2, that's the form that's always sent annually um, to in the enrollment packet. In the past, we had uh, certain grade levels and then children who were new to the school. Now that it's been revised, it needs to be in all enrollment packets and every child's parent is given this and it's to be completed every year. And then also the new enrollees. If a child has, this is the parent's opportunity to um, share any kind of food allergy information or any other health information for the child. If a child has a positive health history, then the nurse is going to set up an interview with the parent using the food allergy health history. And if you look at it, it's a more in-depth health history. It's very specific to food allergies. Um, talks about what kind of reactions they've had, what treatments were used, but it's going to pull in the information. And we all know that if we send a, a form to a parent, they're not going to read it and complete it with the kind of information we're really looking for. We're looking, you know, when we do a, an interview, we're reading between the lines of what the parent is saying. And so it's very, very important that you get a translator to sit there with you if you have a Hispanic parent or uh, that you're able to set up a telephone interview with the parent and schedule the time to really be able to get into what this food allergy is. You may find that it's a food intolerance, but that's something you're not going to know if you just send it home to the parent and you don't investigate. Um, this information that you gain uh, through the interview is going to help with you uh, writing your individual health plan and developing uh, the emergency care plan. Uh, on our website, we have the um, emergency anaphylactic algorithm. It's already up there. It's been posted. These newer forms are not on our website, and that's why they've been emailed to you. But go ahead and take that form and incorporate the information that you have that you've gained from interviewing the parent and use that information to be able to um, develop your emergency care plan. Now on our website, under emergency care, everyone I'm sure has that as a favorite on your computer, right? It's, it is going to be our lifeline because all of their information, every day I look at it, I find new things. But um, make sure that you go to emergency care. And on your handout, you may not be able to see it, but uh, I put the website down there. The emergency care plan, oh, I haven't gone. Okay, the emergency care plan outlines uh, the emergency response by the staff to an emergency, uh, to an allergic reaction uh, to food or food products. The ECP, the emergency care plan, and the IHP are used to teach staff uh, the appropriate action that they need to take in the event of an emergency situation. Again, uh, refer to the emergency care on the website. Now, what you all had emailed to you was a draft of the individual health plan, but it's already on um, the care plans on our website. So, uh, I mean, on health office. So, if you have a child with um, an emergency, uh, with a food allergy, then you're able to go ahead into health office and that is already loaded up and so you'll modify that appropriately. Also, every clinic should have the book, um, individual health care plans for the school nurse. 
it came with a disc. It's a wonderful book, and you can use that also as a resource for building your care plans. Okay, as I mentioned before, our H72, the uh, physician parent request to administer medication or a special procedure, has been upgraded or has been, we've got different editions of them out now. We don't have a lot, but, but the one, there is one for um, food allergies. Uh, one of the reasons we decided that that was a good thing to do was that sometimes you send out the, the old H72 and you get very vague responses. So if you've looked at the new H72 for children with food allergies, it gives very specific requests for information. So we're hoping that we'll get a better response um, to help us with the kids. Now, um, you have got um, emailed to you, and if you'll, you'll see it, we're going to be using this format frequently, but it's our checklist format. And so now we have one for food allergies. This is organizing our food allergy information um, or the steps of the, the planning in the nursing diagnoses. Um, and using the nursing process, which is assessment, diagnosis, outcome identification, planning, implementation, and evaluation. The checklist is going to guide the development of the food allergy plan. It will minimize food allergen exposure in the school setting, and it will provide uh, food allergy risk reduction strategies. Following an uh, anaphylactic, anaphylactic event, um, we're going to utilize a debriefing tool. Um, and this form is it will be an interview where you sit down with everyone who's been involved in the, um, with the, with the food allergy, with the anaphylactic event, and you're going to gather information about the series of events that led up to it, and then um, taking that information, then you'll be able to um, make appropriate changes to the health care plan and the emergency care plan to create the, a, a more appropriate plan for the child. Annual multi-level training is going to be required. Uh, as nurses, campus nurses, we're the health educator regarding food allergies on campus. So we're going to be teaching campus staff, students, parents, guardians, and others. The first level of training is a general um, awareness training. This is uh, very much like what we do with diabetes. You know, the level two presentation on diabetes is a general uh, training that's done for all campus staff every year. The level one uh, will be done for uh, all of our faculty and staff. In the training, you're going to um, provide definitions for food allergy, for anaphylaxis, and discuss the major allergens. You'll be able to compare and contrast food allergy versus food intolerances. And you're going to be um, reviewing the signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis and discuss the medications. The other thing that will be uh, covered in this is how important communication for the entire campus is. Okay, we have some, and all of these resources are in the About Food Allergy document that Suzanne sent out on uh, December 12th, uh, December 4th. So 
For the level one training, you have three resources. You have the foodallergy.org. Um, do you have a food allergy? You have a glossary uh, of terms with foodallergy.org. And then um, there's Kids with Food Allergy Foundation has a website. The level two training is going to be for selected staff. And this is much like the level three training that we do for diabetes. These are going to be staff members, faculty and staff members who have frequent contact with the individual uh, student who has food allergies. So it may include classroom teachers, teacher assistants, uh, the PE teachers and coaches, food service personnel, uh, people who um, are going on field trips. It's real important that we have a plan in place for when the children are leaving campus, school bus drivers, and then other campus staff that would be designated by the principal. So with the level two training, it's gonna provide guidance and direction to staff or a student with uh, a food allergy plan. Within it, you're gonna review the IHP and the ECP. Uh, we have a skill checklist uh, for medication administration that you'll be uh, providing for the designated staff. You'll discuss how to prevent allergen exposure in the school and discuss recognition of the signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis. Again, we're going to really uh, enforce how important, uh, reinforce how important communication is. And then also practice appropriate responses to enable staff to take action quickly. Okay, the resource for um, the level two training is the Food Allergy Basics website. Every, every resource listed was sent to you on December 4th by Suzanne. Okay, so you've got all of this. I've just recapped it. The level three training is the health professional training, and that's the training that you all are going to do for yourself. At the beginning of each year, you're going to uh, complete one or more online instructional offerings, PowerPoint or video demonstrations. Uh, you should repeat these offerings or selections as needed because what we want to do is to continue to add and reinforce our personal knowledge as it relates to food allergies. So once again, we've got the level three resources which you have had provided to you by email. Um, you're to complete the training and the coursework and provide that information to your nurse supervisor. You need to complete two each year. Um, so we've got the, the FAN, the Food Allergy Basics website by FAN, and the Allergy Ready coursework. Oh, there they are. Now we have a fourth level training, and that is training that you provide to students. And so you're going to provide this to a child with a food allergy, but also to their classmates. Because it's real important that the classmates understand what's going on. Um, when, when you pick, you've got um, several to choose from, but when you're going through them, you need to look at the age appropriateness and, um, of this information. The other thing that is important to do is read the, contact, the content for accuracy by the medical community. 
And so you want things that are endorsed by FAN and by uh, the American Academy of Allergy and Asthma, Immunology, and the FDA, and then other established medical leaders, medical experts. So you're not going to use any FDA unapproved products. So these are the resources for the children. And uh, once again, I know they're hard to read on your handout, but they were emailed to you. If you downloaded it and brought it with you, you could look at, well, it, if you look through it, it's there, Tina. Oops. Okay. The thing that I want to leave you with is that we need to partner with parents to make sure that they locate a medical home to promote continuity of care. So many of our parents don't have one health care provider, and they're going from ER to ER and doctor to doctor. So I think it's really important that all of us take uh, assist these families in finding the best medical provider for them so that they can get the kind of support and care that they need. It's important that we look at this as a team approach, a campus approach. Parents are part of the team, uh, but so is the entire faculty, uh, so that people know what they need to do. Uh, through these efforts, we're going to support the quality of life for the child, but also for the campus, we're going to be um, raising their knowledge about food allergies. Um, and hopefully create an allergy-free zone for our kids. Any questions? Yes? Yes. Yeah, anything, anything that other than a nebulizer. I mean, nebul I mean a nebulizer, any the EpiPen, the feeding tubes, uh, the meter dose inhalers do not, but everything else just about does other than a medical, uh, oral medication. Yes? That's the recommendation. And I'll let Suzanne. <laughs> it's a discussion. It's a new thing for us. Uh, well, it's a, it's a new position for us, and so we're, um, I'm going to defer to Suzanne. What's important to consider here is that, is that loud? <clears throat> What's important to consider here is access. Be sure there is access, because you don't want a barrier there. Should you not be in your office, you're someplace else, or you're absent for the day. So you have to communicate with your staff where the EpiPen is and to be sure it's accessible and not locked in some cabinet and they don't have keys to get into it. That's not an excuse not to have the EpiPen there. So you arrange with your staff and with your administrator where that should be. Now if the child has been gone through the training with you, you feel comfortable, the physician says they can carry that EpiPen well then, they'll carry the EpiPen, but again, you planned for that and how that is to take place. That is not different than trying to access something else like insulin or some other type of something that is needed for a child. You're not going to put it in an area where it can't be accessible. doesn't mean that we don't secure it. It just means that it has to be readily accessible. Not any different than your AEDs on campus have to be readily accessible. So you plan for that on your campus. What does that mean? I know that we always think with the paradigm that everything is locked behind a locked cabinet because that's the way we operate with the majority of medications, especially controlled substances that we have on campuses. <clears throat> but be sure that if it's life-threatening, you need an EpiPen, you need to get to it, and how that's going to be arranged. So you work with your administrator and with your staff 
how you're going to put that on campus so that they can access it. Okay? It's going to be different from each campus. The main thing is don't leave it behind a locked cabinet where staff can't get to it or where a child can't access it. So keep that in the plan.